right, so this first video today, we're going to go over the uh, skull, specifically the cranial bones. So what I'm going to do is I've got an old uh, friend here with a little spring tongue. His mandible falls off. So I'm going to set that down. All right. So you're going to go uh, over the cranial bones. There are only eight cranial bones. Uh, there are 22 bones total in the skull. Eight of them are cranial bones. The other 14 are the face and jaw. We'll do that in a separate video. So you're going to have your occiput, your occipital bone. There's one of those. Then you'll have uh, your parietal bones. There are two of those. Then you'll have a frontal bone, one frontal bone, temporal bone. There are two of those. And then you're going to have one called the sphenoid, which is tough to see, and an ethmoid. All right, so those would be... Uh, three, four, six, seven, and eight bones of the cranium. So now I'm going to point them out on my model. And just a few major landmarks that would be of interest um, later, so we have bony attachments and things. So the first bone that we talked about is going to be the occipital bone, the occiput. This is the rear portion of your skull, your cranium. You can reach back and feel on the base of your own skull, you find this little bump. That's this little protrusion right here. This bump is called the external occipital protuberance. Let me see if I can get a pointer of some sort. This is the external occipital protuberance. Right? Now running parallel to the external occipital protuberance or EOP, you're going to have superior and inferior nuchal lines that run out like this. These are these little lines that run out from the EOP that you can have a lot of muscular attachments on this model indicated by these red and blue painted areas. Nuchal lines. You might be able to palpate that on your own skull. I'm going to rotate the skull so it's facing the floor and we're looking at the underside or the inferior version uh, uh, view of the skull and we're still looking at the occipital bone and you're going to notice uh, right away that on the floor of the occipital bone there's a giant hole. Okay, this is called the foramen magnum, which is Latin for giant hole. So that'll be super easy. On the lateral aspects or the edges of the giant hole are these two uh, rockers. These are called the occipital condyles. This is what articulates or sits on the top of your spine so that your skull can nod and start to move around. The occipital bone is going to extend even further under. Now remember, normally this is all encompassed by your neck. But this is the basilar portion of the occipital bone. And the anterior portion on the inside of the skull is called the clivus. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay? That's the occipital bone. Okay? Um, the next pair of bones will be the parietal bones. Okay? These would be these large, uh, the corner of your skull. These large parietal bones, uh, they're paired right and left. They're going to articulate with each other right in the midline and with the occipital bone on this uh, line back here. These lines, these little squiggly lines, are the joints known as sutures. Right? These are the sutures. Uh, it's a type of um, syndesmosis, one of the uh, types of articulations, uh, also with the amphiarthroses and the um, diarthrodial joints. This is a synarthrodial joint. So, I mean, it's, it's joined right up together. The um, lambdwaddle suture is this one that runs from the, above the occiput to the two parietals. The one in the middle is the sagittal suture. You've got one up here in the front that is the coronal suture, and then one on the side called the squamous suture. Uh, those are the big ones. We'll come back to the details of those in a little bit. Okay. So the two parietal bones are going to form the lateral or side wall of your skull. In the front, the two parietal bones are going to articulate with the frontal bone, which is the your forehead basically. Right? So you can feel that. And this is the squamous or flat portion of the frontal bone. The frontal bone is going to, this little uh, area between your eyebrows called the glabella, that flat spot, and then those two ridges that form your eyebrows. These are called the supraorbital, meaning above the eye socket, supraorbital margins or supraorbital ridge. You notice there's a little, my little pointer, it's a little notch or a little opening at about the medial third of the supraorbital margin or ridge, that's the super or, supraorbital foramen. Okay? We'll come back to all the little openings and what are in them later. 
the occipital bone, the, sorry, the frontal bone is also going to form the, the roof of your eye socket or orbit. Okay? We're going to remove the, the dome or the calvaria, the little soup bowl um, fame, uh, famed by uh, Vikings and other heathens that eat their cereal from the skulls of their enemies. And you can see how the frontal bone also makes the, the roof of the orbit, this eye socket here. That's the roof of the orbit. Okay. The next, there's only one frontal bone. The next pair of bones are going to be your temporal bone. This will be on your side, kind of where, you can see this, the temple of your glasses uh, runs across there. It's also called the temple bone. It comes from the same root word as uh, temporis or uh, temporal, meaning time, because this is where the hair would start to turn gray uh, first. So they call it the temporal bone. Lots of parts of the temporal bone. There's this squamous portion that's the weakest and thinnest part of your skull. Um, normally your ear would be right here. Your external ear or pina, the ear flap, the cartilage and lobe, that's all right here. Okay. The temporal bone has this large flat squamous part. And then it's got this um, external auditory meatus, which is the next most prominent area. Like I said, your ear would be kind of right here. Then there's this large chonky portion that sticks out here. This is the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Just anterior or toward the front of the face, you're going to find the mandibular fossa. That's where the jawbone would articulate. We'll get over the parts of the jaw in another video. Then you've got this little bridge of bone that projects forward. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And it's going to articulate with one of the facial bones called the zygomaticus and make this arch. And there's a lot of, uh, there's some muscle that dip down between this space in your skull. If you feel above your cheekbone, right where your temple's at, you can't get your fingers in there because that zygomatic process is pretty beefy and filled with muscle like this large temporalis and the masseter from underneath there that helps you chew. And we'll come back over those in a little bit. So that's the temporal bone. Another part of the temporal bone on the inside is this really thick um, ridge of bone. That's called the petrous ridge or the petrous portion of the, uh, meaning rock-like, portion of the temporal bone. And that houses um, your little... Uh, inner ear bones, the uh, cochlea and the circular canals and such. So a lot of hearing apparatus takes place there. So the petrous ridge or the petrous portion of the temporal bone also helps to separate the posterior cranial fossa, which is the lowest portion that your brain nestles down into, um, mostly formed by the, the floor that is formed by the occipital bone, the middle cranial fossa where the anterior portion of your temporal lobe sit, and the superior cranial fossa, which is above your orbits or your eye sockets, uh, made up by the frontal bone. All right. Now, the next two bones, speaking of the middle cranial fossa and um, the anterior, are the sphenoid and ethmoid bones. The sphenoid is pretty hard to see from a model. If I had a model I could take apart, we could show you. But it forms this whole portion called the greater wing of the sphenoid. And it's right in the body, uh, or right... The body is right between those two, uh, the greater wings. Then it has some lesser wings toward the front that will form the rear of the orbit. And you can see the little um, the orbital fissures in there. Okay. Kind of hard to get at those. But the sphenoid bone is kind of bat-shaped or butterfly-shaped with these wings. If you look at the outer, let me set my skull down. The outer view, lateral view, you see the temporal bone, and then right behind the, the zygomatic process, you can see the outer edge or outer extent of the sphenoid bone. Okay. Sphenoid bone sits in the middle, uh, butts right up against or articulates with the, the clivus or the anterior portion of the occipital bone. The petrous ridge uh, on both sides of the temporal bone. And then it's going to articulate with the frontal bone uh, toward the front, uh, where it helps form the orbit. The most distinguished feature is this uh, Turkish saddle, or the cella tersica, that's formed in the body of the sphenoid. If I turn it from the side a little bit, you can see it sort of resembles a saddle. With the dorsum celli, this back wall, and then the little dipped-in part where somebody would, if 
I had a little action figure, I could set him on there. Turkish saddle. And this is the uh, hypophysial fossa. That's where the pituitary gland is going to kind of nestle down in there. Now, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of soft tissue inside the skull for later. The tentorium cerebelli will run along the petrous ridge in here and separate the, some of the cranial compartments. We'll come back to that in another video. Another important part of the sphenoid bone is from an inferior view of the skull with the jaw and the neck removed. And it's going to be these two structures right here. And you see how there's two little ridges or plates? This is your pterygoid, right? So you got the medial pterygoid plate and the lateral pterygoid plate. And there's a little fossa, pterygoid fossa, that's in there. This one's all covered uh, in red. I think the other one's just blank. So those are also part of... Uh, uh, off the inferior projection of your sphenoid bone, and they're going to help form the walls of your nasal uh, concha, the, the cavities or openings that if we look back again, you can see right into the nose there. And they go right back by the pterygoid. So uh, we're going to cover face in the next video, but those are the eight bones of the skull. Oop, I almost forgot one. <laughs> the ethmoid bone. This one sits like a block right in the center of the skull, or the anterior portion of the skull. And it's, it's uh, between the orbits and behind your nose, behind these nasal bones that go straight in. And if we look down in the skull, this time the skull is looking to the floor. You see those little holes, little holes and openings? That's in a flat plate, the flat top of the ethmoid. It's called the cribiform plate. And it surrounds this ridge right here called the cristagalli. And those little, the cribiform plate allows lots of neural structures, mainly your um, olfactory nerves to come in and out into the nasal cavity. And then there's a, besides the horizontal plate, the cribiform, there's a perpendicular plate that's going to form <clears throat> behind the nasal bones to help divide into right and left nasal concha. So those are going to be the, uh, the start of the nasal bones. It'll join up with the palatine and, and vomer in a little bit, and we'll get some of the the concha in there too, uh, the turbinate bones. So those are the eight bones of the skull, and we'll cover the eight bones of the face in another face and jaw in another video.